Uh, hey guys, welcome back to Home Built and the Alfa Rari runs as you might have seen last episode. So uh, next thing on the agenda is to work towards getting it to drive. All right, guys, welcome back. Hopefully you guys saw the last episode where I finally got the engine started in the Alfa Rari. If you missed it, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up. And like always, please think about subscribing, hitting the notification bell. Uh, that stuff really helps the channel out. Moving forward, we got it to run. There were um, a couple of issues that I went through that uh, were, were quite, um, quite a challenge. It was quite a long week trying to get all the bits and pieces together, lots of wiring, gremlins and stuff like that. Another huge thanks to Adam at Link who um, uh, talked me through uh, a bunch of the, uh, the things and sort of showed my errors, which uh, I knew there would be, and that's what uh, we got over the line with. But it runs, but uh, there's still a few issues that I need to uh, go through and, uh, and sort out. So uh, let's start covering some of those. And just a quick note, guys, this is going to be the last episode on the Alferrari for a, um, a short period, just because I am off to Ren Sport Reunion in the US. Any of you going there and you see me, please uh, come up and say hi. Uh, I love to uh, have a chat with uh, all of you. And we will then be doing, myself and Mrs. Jeff, a road trip uh, on the southeast coast. So uh, there'll be a couple of uh, times I'll put out for meetups. So just keep an eye on Instagram and Facebook where I would potentially uh, let you guys know where we're gonna be if you wanna come and say hi. All right. So the next thing that was not smooth sailing last week was right down in the depths down in here. So you can see there, I think you can pick that up on the camera, you can see that the, uh, the V-band clamp is rubbing on the side of the body of the car. Um, I thought I left enough room when I first made it, but then I put, there's a reinforcing plate over there that uh, spaced things out a bit more, and there's just less space. I think I did it without the clamps on, so there's less space than I thought. So that is the next issue, because that is currently just straight hard onto the side of the car. So now we're looking from underneath. Uh, you can see the base of the engine here. This is where my dry sump has to come out. You can see that's where the V-band clamp is there. And the frame rail is right here. So there's everything is so tight all in this place. There is no other way to set it up. Uh, I am gonna put some heat shield in between the oil and the exhaust, but... All right, so it's not the greatest design, but there's just... There's so little room to play with in this whole area in here. So I have my dry sump tank, I have my steering arm, I have the exhaust and the, um, the chassis rails and the engine. So there's just, there is no room to put anything else in that area and trying to fit all those things into that space has proven to be a real nightmare and, and you can see there. I thought I'd made enough room, there's actually, um, Basically, when I was building the car, I put some reinforcing plates on the outside and on the inside of the frame wire rail. And um, I knew it was close and I did some clearancing, but obviously it's not enough. By the time when I made the headers, I didn't have the reinforcing plates in. The reinforcing plates are only a few mil thick, but then that and the weld and everything else means that they're really close. Now, the engine will move uh, when it's uh, being driven, but not like a regular engine, these engine mounts are quite firm. They're actually um, cotton reel mounts made out of polyurethane leaf spring uh, bushings. So yes, there is movement, but not, not a lot at all. There's 10 mil all the way around the engine. It's gonna move a lot less than that. It's, it's gonna be quite firm. We're gonna get vibrations with the car, but I don't want the uh, exhaust header like sort of sitting on the, uh, on the frame and just, and just bashing the, the frame and feeling the vibration through your feet. So that is gonna be quite a challenge to move it. Now, I've got a couple of options. I'm going to just have a bit of a play and see what I can come up with and I'll show you uh, what solution I get. All right. 
right, so you can see here the, um, the heat tape stuff I've put on um, has buckled up a bit from where the clamp is holding it, but there's actually quite a bit of room with the, uh, the clamp cut off. I couldn't actually remove the clamp anymore. Obviously the, uh, the header, it's, it's getting hot for the first time and it's starting to sort of move around. So doing a lot now is probably not a great idea because it's gonna probably move more. But what I've decided I'm going to do to, um, to sort this out is I need to move this clamp down to about here and I don't want to pull the engine out of the car and I was thinking oh that's not really possible to weld all the way around but thankfully because I've got the v-bands the v-bands basically just clamp the uh, the the two sections of the housing together I should be able to get the TIG welder in there and be able to weld around a lot of the edge of the uh, the two clamps and weld the uh, a piece on and and have another clamp up a little bit further all right so i took my exhaust off i made sure i marked it all over the place before i removed it so i know exactly the orientation and that sort of stuff that i need um, when I weld this part back onto the car. So I've got some new V-band clamps that I'm going to uh, weld up now and um, I've sort of marked them out. I've got the distances right. So this will all fit in the way it fit before, hopefully. Um, just, um, yeah, with the, the clamp further down, this will then become part of the header and uh, it'll just make it so much easier to, uh, to uh, A, to clamp up, and B, there, there shouldn't be any clearance issues, and uh, yeah, and, and hopefully uh, it will, I'll be able to weld it up, like I said, enough all the way around, keep it nice and tight so that there's no uh, exhaust leak without having to take the engine back out of the car, which I do not want to do uh, at the moment. So uh, let's weld this up. It gives me a nice chance to, uh, Try out my cool new uh, world-class welding helmet. Nice big, uh, nice big clear screen, so it should make it nice and easy to uh, weld this up. Let's do it. All right, so I've got my fitting here. I actually got the die grinder in the edge and uh, carved that down to make myself a whole bunch of space. So there's a still, there's a bunch of space in there now, at least comparatively to the rest of the engine. And uh, and I also went through and uh, and ground a slot down on the uh, the extra piece. So this little piece here that I've now welded up has to join on to this. Now I marked it where the angle it needs to be. Now I'm gonna try and clamp it in place and weld it on and it should have heaps of clearance to actually a be able to bolt it together and and and, and that sort of thing and b and i'm just thinking now it may make it difficult to pull the engine out later we'll deal with that then if i have to cut this off to get the engine out if i when i eventually go to cut the break take the engine out again that may be the case. We can, we can deal with that when we get there. For the time being, I'm gonna weld this on and, uh, and then hopefully we'll have a nice seal. Because it's got the, uh, this extra flange in here, it sort of locks in and it's, uh, it's got a fair bit of space. So I'm gonna try and clamp uh, a couple of the clamps on either side to hold this nice and tight. And then, um, yeah, you'll see what, I'm, what I mean. But uh, if I can weld this in, we should be, uh, we should be looking pretty good. Alright, so I managed to weld, I got most of the way around the top uh, and, uh, and all the way around the bottom and then most of the way up the other side and uh, that should hopefully not give me any exhaust leaks, that's nice and tight. So now we uh, need to connect up the rest of the exhaust, make sure everything's nice, straight and square, it's going to connect up and then we can uh, call that bit done.
All right, so I put some heat wrap on the header where I've welded on this new section um, so you sort of protect it against the dry sump oil line and um, yeah, that will give it a little bit of shielding there. So uh, now we need to move on, remove the uh, bash plate here and start fitting some brakes and clutch. All right, so what I've been assembling has been the brake and clutch uh, master cylinder assemblies. With uh, It's got a brake balance bar here, um, adjustable. This is uh, a basic design that Colin Byrne uh, had designed up and sent through to me so that I could uh, have a play with it. And um, yeah, so, so it basically uses the factory pedal uh, to, to, but gives it uh, adjustable bias front and rear. No booster. Manual brakes, I actually really like manual brakes. I have manual brakes in my 911. I like the, um, the, the analog feel where the booster's not um, giving like slightly varied, you know, pedal depending on how much vacuum it's getting, etc. Like uh, the uh, uh, manual brakes are actually really, uh, really good if they're done well. Um, and this, of course, is my clutch master cylinder. So this, again, I designed this one up. Like these that Colin had designed, I just made this bit up. And these master cylinders will be accessible from just in front of the driver's seat up in um, the cabin of the car. I know it's a bit weird, but that's where I could fit it. If you've seen the car now, you see that there's no room for anything. Everything was thought about and considered, and that's where we go. So let's bolt this stuff up and uh, see if my brake lines and everything fit up the way they're supposed to. Okay, so after basically a whole day, I now have my brakes set up. So I have my pedal. Um, this is my bias front and rear brakes. Um, I actually was really struggling with getting the, uh, um, the lines on. I managed to see, get one on, on this side. I didn't have a fitting that was long enough. I had a bunch of these little fittings, but the ones I had were too short and were bottoming out. And I went over to see my mate Benny at Benny's Custom Works and he was saying, uh, yeah, the reason why I wasn't finding fittings long enough, I had one that was a bit longer, uh, so that other line is connected and it's too hard to pull it apart, so I'm just <laughs> leaving it there. Uh, it's actually designed to be banjo fittings, so I used some Raceworks banjo fittings and connected that up, so thank you, Benny. Uh, go and check out Benny's Custom Works channel. Now, uh, on the other side, I have my clutch set up and uh, clutch that's all connected up to the factory pedal. So both sides, it's connected up to the factory pedals. Everything is tight. As I said, I actually had ended up having to remove the starter motor up there to be able to get the, uh, the clutch line in. The clutch line goes up in here. Everything is tight. So uh, that is actually my brake pressure switch. <sighs> it's a whole day of work to get to this, but we now have brakes connected up front and rear. So now it's time to uh, put some brake pads in so we can bleed some brakes. All right, so we went around and uh, I've got brake pads in all of the C12 racing brake calipers. Really easy to install the pads because you just uh, take these two pins out and slide the pads in from behind. So that's nice and easy. And my brake uh, master cylinders are all here. The reservoirs are, are ready to go. This obviously has this lid that sits over it and it has the, uh, it will be trimmed in leather. It's not gonna stay that color. Well, let's start bleeding some brakes. All right, so after um, at least half an hour of messing around, just trying to get to the slave cylinder, because it's deep inside the tunnel, it's a real mission. Uh, and how much, I swear, I hated these vacuum brake bleeders. 
this is what I had to use because I don't also have a fitting that will fit on the top of the master cylinder. So that's the only issue is you need to have the correct fittings to fit on top of the master cylinder to create a seal to force the fluid through. I still think the pressure bleeders are better. You just need to make sure you've got the right bits. So uh, we now have a clutch. So if you can see through the mess of wiring, you can see that I have a clutch that is activating and I can feel it on my foot. Perfect. All right, well, I have spent multiple hours now going around, uh, messing around, trying to bleed the brakes, realizing that I messed a whole bunch of stuff up. So uh, these brakes are supposed to be using banjo bolts to uh, actually uh, connect into the, the calipers. And I put brake fitting straight into them. So they, they haven't been sealing properly. Like they're not designed for that. Yeah, there's so many things that I have not done correctly. So. Basically, uh, I have not been able to bleed the brakes. I have been able to bleed, bleed the clutch. The clutch is working and I have a clutch, which is fantastic because that was really difficult to get into. At least with the brakes, they're easy to get to. I can get around them. Just not when you don't have the uh, right brake lines going into them. So uh, I have not been able to bleed the brakes and I'm just out of time. I'm actually packing up and I'm about to uh, head off to the US for Ren Sport Reunion. Hopefully you'll join me for that. But I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, last week we talked about the Ferrari 458 Italia. And in 2011, Ferrari released a new convertible version, the 458 Spider. The Spider features an aluminium retractable hardtop that they claimed was 25 kilos lighter than the soft top on the F430. In 2013, the 458 Speciali was released, which received numerous performance and cosmetic upgrades. It had forged wheels, vented bonnet, and a taller rear spoiler. The 4.5 litre naturally aspirated V8 was revised and bumped up to 600 horsepower. Over the three year run, 1,309 examples were produced. In 2014, the 458 Speciali Aperta was produced with Aperta, of course, meaning open for the open top design. There were only 499 of these examples ever produced. All right, that was a very frustrating week, to be honest. <laughs> I did manage to fix that exhaust, although <coughs> it's still yet to be seen whether I can actually get it, the engine back out of the car with that uh, uh, longer exhaust on it. That's oh. a future Jeff problem. I have to cut it off and get it out. And at the moment, it should be good in the car as it were, <laughs> as it is. We have working clutch. We don't have working brakes because I spent ages and tore my hair out. So uh, yeah, and we're off. We um, yeah. Yes, yes. I'm off to Rensport reunion. So <coughs> as I said, <coughs> we'll see some of you there. And uh, Mrs. Jeff and myself will catch up with some of you. Absolutely. Um, please like and subscribe. Add. Yeah. Sorry, using voice. Yes, and over. follow, <laughs> and uh, as I said, uh, follow, follow me, follow us on uh, Facebook and Instagram to uh, see where we're going to be and uh, what we're doing over the next little bit in the US. See you guys. See you guys. Hey guys, last week we talked about the Ferrari 458 Spider. Italia. The Spider features an aluminium retractable soft top, which... Hard, hard top. <laughs> <laughs> and over the three-year run, over thir hmm. 